I just thought I would, I would go through um, a couple of quick agreements again. Um, the first one is have fun as usual. Um, ask as many questions as possible. I will um, unmute you if I can so we can have a conversation. I've opened the chat box to everyone this time using Zoom rather than go to webinar so um, everyone can see each other's um, conversations and, and questions. <coughs> um, and uh, as, as with everything, the 80% rule applies. So, it, it, you know, we're dealing with human science and um, it's, it's uh, a case of anything above 80% uh, as, a, as a return on an experiment is deemed a, a staggering success. So if there's anything that doesn't quite resonate with you, that's perfectly fine. Um, I'll, uh, I'll be open to, to your own personal views and, and um, you know, I'm sure that the, the idea is that um, for the majority of people, most of this applies. So there's no such thing as 100% of things apply to 100% of people 100% of the time. So by all means, ask questions. Um, and uh, the, uh, the other thing is, sorry, I've just got a message from, uh, okay, so all panelists and attendees can see the messages. Great, thanks for that, Abby. Um, ask questions, uh, share any tips, and, and, and be collaborative. So there you go. Now, quickly about me, um, I'm head of business performance for RadTech. Previous to that, I built a couple of successful um, tech companies. And before that, I was in uh, HR, looking after about 1,800 front office staff in, in banking. And those two um, companies that I built, pretty much everything was virtual. Um, so virtual teams and delivery of value virtually. And um, so this is a, a pretty um, comfortable place for me to be. Uh, so we'll go through um, the the sort of the training now, if that's okay. I'm just gonna very quickly dismiss some of these boxes. So this is one of my favorite quotes from Chip Conley. He's, he's a brilliant guy. If you ever get the chance to listen to him, he's phenomenal. We live in an era in which neuroscientists are teaching us about the malleability of our brain and the emotionally contagious nature of our workplace. For all human, it's the most important neglected fact in business. Now this is especially true when our teams are virtual, we have this kind of real need for human connection. And we know that a strong connection improves um, business outcomes. It's, it's really that simple. Paul Zak, who's a neuroeconomist, says that, you know, um, in his work, uh, teams that have a strong um, sense of trust and a high degree of purpose outperform their peers every time. So, you know, in the, in the sort of uh, the world that we're in at the minute, where many of our team members are now virtual we've got to work that that much harder and in this first sort of um module i thought i would focus on what makes individuals thrive and i'm going to focus on two main pieces uh, to today to help you with some tools uh, to to get uh, the best out of your teams especially while they're sat all around the country and all around the world um so for most of us, we think that our organizations look like this. I know for a lot of senior leaders that I talk to, talk about organizational charts, and this is particularly humorous uh, version of an organizational chart with some of these sort of relational uh, <laughs> issues. Uh, I think this is a slightly cynical version. I think it came from Zappos originally, um, but, but that's not what a human system looks like. It actually looks more like this. And you know, if you think about it as, as those dots, Red and green dots are like um, nodes in a system. They represent teams or individuals. And so all of those teams and individuals are in relationship with other people in the business. And that's that sense, uh, as Senge calls it, of human enacted interdependence. So it, in systems theory, it's called a, a, a complex uh, adaptive system. Um, and you and your virtual sort of team sitting in, in this interdependent network of relationships. Uh, and this is really important for the rest of um, this little piece this, today um, to understand because um, these relationships and the strengths of those relationships are key, not only to business outcomes, but to, to people's engagement levels, their, um, 
their sense of psychological safety and so on and so forth. So um, there is what I call a great shift going on at the minute. And this is an infographic I did some time ago. And <clears throat> the great shift, uh, as explained in this infographic, if you look at the top, is a sort of macro level societal sh shift that we're moving from this mechanistic understanding of belief that organizations are mechanistic, like big machines, you know, and you pull a lever uh, here and then something happens there. And what we're really starting to understand is they're not mechanistic at all. They're organic, these human enacted um, networks. And the, the uh, purpose of this particular infographic is to show that right at the bottom here, um, that's kind of the individual level. That's what we're focused on today. But as you go up the infographic, it goes from individual to team to organizational to societal level. And they're all linked. They're all um, impacted by this um, slow but consistent change that we're going through. So if, if we were living during the sort of the heart of the Industrial Revolution, we would have said it was an exciting time. We wouldn't have realized we were in the middle of some kind of revolution. And similarly, right now, today, we're in the middle of, you know, what's been called many terms a digital revolution and so on and so forth. But the truth of the matter is, is that we're in the midst of a revolution and COVID-19 to a degree has put a Bunsen burner on actually a flamethrower under that, where we're going to start seeing organizational models change. Um, and this plays well into what we're going to talk about today, because what happens at the organizational level impacts at the individual level. And what happens at the individual level impacts at the team and the organizational level. It works both ways. So I thought I would start with a little exercise. This is uh, uh, Laura King. This is an exercise I learned um, working with Tal Ben-Shahar, my mentor, who's a positive psychologist from Harvard University. So um, I want to, uh, I'm just going to read this out and then ask you to spend just, just five minutes jotting down some answers to this. Um, and the purpose of this exercise is um, to prove that there are universal truths to what makes individuals thrive. So I could, I could tell you there are universal truths, and, and it, it, you would be right. Right to be slightly cynical, say so I'm not sure that's true. So that in this um, exercise, we're gonna try and prove that there are universal truths to human thriving. So I'll read it out and then just scribble down what immediately comes to mind. So think about your life in the future as a 109 year old. Imagine that everything has gone as well as it possibly could. And you've also got your marbles and you're also physically well. Um, you've worked hard and succeeded at accomplishing all of your life goals. Think of this as the realization of all your life dreams. Please write down whatever springs to mind. It's a really important exercise. So I'll give you five minutes. I'll just get set up with something else while, while you're scribbling. Write anything. And don't edit yourself. Usually the first thing you write and then, the, you know, is, is the most accurate and the most important. Uh, just looking at the clock. We'll give it another two or three minutes. Now let me scribble away. We need some, some lift music in the background. I don't think you want to hear me sing more. <laughs> Terrible. So we uh, just read through it again while you're scribbling. Think about your life in the future as a 109-year-old. Imagine that everything has gone as well as it possibly could. You've worked hard and succeeded at accomplishing all your life goals. Think of this as a realization of all your dreams. Write down whatever springs to mind. Okay, 
Now, normally I take about five or 10 minutes, but this being a, um, a virtual delivery, we thought uh, I'll do something a little bit more uh, quickly. So Abby's already beat me to the punch. So Abby, you get 10 points and three bags of cheesy watsits. So that's phenomenal. If you could do me a favor, and in the chat box, just write, uh, just note down the sort of key themes that came up. So Abby has kind of done this uh, perfectly. Um, talked about, you know, uh, family. So family, big one, big theme. Um, travel, um, sense of peace. So um, for, for everybody else, just, just two or three key themes, just throw them up. And then let's see where we get to. So now I'm asking you to type in the chat box as well as scribble everything down. All of this hard work. Let's give that a couple more minutes. See what else comes up. Surrounded by family. Thanks, Mike. That's brilliant. Um, <laughs> relax in some way, Sunny. Yes, that would be fabulous. And can we all come, please? Um, that would be great. So I'll let, I'll let more uh, trickle through. Thanks, David. Family, happiness, health. So um, as they come through uh, in the chat box, and if I have lost 20 people by updating the time, um, please forgive me. I'm sorry about that. And uh, I will get this recording out to you. Luckily, we've got everyone's uh, email address from last week. When, um, there was nearly 100 of us together last week. So, um, so the, this is really important. And uh, I said I would try and prove to you um, the truth of this. So what you're looking at there are photographs from, thanks, Phil. Happy, healthy, uh, happy children and grandchildren, financially secure, and have a successful career. Um, phenomenal. These um, photographs are taken from exercises where I've done this with senior teams, um, you know, a variety of uh, people in agile leadership courses from different backgrounds, different walks of life, different uh, cultures and countries of origin and so on. And yet these themes come up over and over again. And um, what Phil and, and Dave, Mike and Abby have started to articulate are these kind of universal truths about what makes individuals thrive. And um, we, I use this an, um, ac an ac acronym, EMPOWERS, um, and it's, it's very, very powerful. So I'm gonna ask you to scribble this down. So I'm going, really high tech now with the old school whiteboard, which is, um, which means that I do some work. So um, if you scribble this down, this will help guide you for the rest of this session. And it is about 10 years worth of my life in this. So what does E stand for? What are these universal truths? And the answer is engagement. Engagement. Now, from a science perspective, what scientists will talk about is something like flow um, or deep work. Now, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this in a minute. Um, the next one will come as no surprise meaning and purpose. Now, probably the first time I saw that articulated was with. Um, Marty Seligman, composite psychologist, but one of the best books I've read on meaning um, was by uh, Emily Espahani Smith. So what about the next one? Now this one always, so there's a little surprising to people, um, but it's a massively underestimated in most organizations. And I am gonna spend a little bit of time on this as well, positive emotion. So, um, we've got engagement, meaning and purpose, which I think speaks for itself. We need a sense of meaning in our lives and we need to experience positive emotion. Now this one and this one, engagement and positive emotion, we're gonna spend a little bit of time on. Okay, I'll just make sure you can see this. O stands for others. 
And what I mean by that is relationships and belonging. Um, there's a colleague of Martin Selgerman that said, others matter. We're starting to understand that others matter so much, um, uh, you know, from social cognitive neuroscience. It's literally a survival um, mechanism in the brain. Uh, w stands for wisdom um, or mastery is another good word. Um, so I think Dan Pink's book on mastery, uh, let me see if I've got it here, which I do. So he wrote Drive, Daniel Pink. Um, and he talked a lot about um, mastery, autonomy, uh, you know, so wisdom is, is really, really important. This, this sense of personal growth. Now, the next one usually surprises people and it's exercise. Now, why would I talk about exercise when I'm, when I'm talking about human thriving? Well, it turns out there's a chap called John Rady who wrote an extraordinary book called Spark that exercise is not about keeping your body healthy. We now understanding that exercise is profoundly important for brain health. So when you exercise, your brain creates a, a chemical called brain-derived neurotropic factor, and that triggers neurogenesis, the creation of new brain cells. And so for all of us, particularly in this virtual world, most of us are sitting on our bums at the minute. And John says that's the equivalent of sort of firing on three cylinders. Um, okay, let's keep going. So resilience. Gosh, it's right inside it, sideways will not be one of my core strengths. Resilience, a great book is grit. Uh, Angela Duckworth is probably the leading um, researcher into resilience. We are being tested right now, and um, there is no doubt in my mind that resilience for most people um, is being tested, and it is a muscle. So you can improve your resilience and your grit with practice. And then finally, uh, safety. This is Simon Sinek's book, Leaders Eat Last, and safety by which I mean psychological safety. Um, we're starting to understand that psychological safety is critical to uh, thriving, it's critical to a sense of uh, well-being and so on and so forth. So that's the Empowers model. There's a huge, as you can see, there's a lot of research behind it. I picked only one book per topic, but there are many as you can imagine. Um, now let's link it back to the answers very quickly. So um, when we talk about um, travel, and being in nature and travel. We're often talking about uh, times when we're at peace, so we're experiencing positive emotion, uh, or in a place of flow. So you'll often hear people who go on skiing holidays that they're just totally in the moment when they're skiing down the mountain and forget about all of their problems. That's a flow experience. Um, leaving a legacy, making a difference, family, that's all about having a sense of meaning and purpose. Successful career, that's about you know, having, having made an impact, that's about its meaningful and, and, and purpose. Um, enjoying the moment, um, peace, happiness, they're all positive emotion. A lot of people mention family and children and grandchildren, that's obviously others matter, relationships and so on. Um, and then personal growth. Personal growth comes from travel, comes from your career, it comes from um, giving kind of certain um, uh, uh, I suppose impacts in the world as you go along, uh, you know, so, so wisdom, mastery, personal growth, and then exercise is, is, is linked directly to, I want to end my life still healthy and upright. Um, die with my boots on, which is a phrase that I've heard a few times. Um, and for me personally, resilience is a big one. I think leaving the corporate world in the safety of the corporate world, um, and then building a couple of businesses, going through 2008 global financial crisis and stuff like that. Um, certainly, I got to test my resilience muscles. It was, it, it has been a hell of a ride. So um, I just wanted to share that with you. That um, your your core drivers are exactly the same as the people who are working in your teams all around the world. These these universal truths. I've tested this many times. Um, I see over and over again. So, quick question. Um, 
your morning routine. I'm going to start with engagement. I'm just going to cover two pieces for today um, because I think they're two that I would focus on um, for myself and my team. And it, these are things that I do quite regularly. So I wanted to ask, how quickly after you wake up in the morning do you check your phone? Sounds like an odd question, but there's a very deliberate reason for asking it. So how quickly after you wake up in the morning do you start looking at your phone? Answers in the chat box, please. We'll give that a second or two. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Okay, immediately, immediately. Okay, so when I get to work, that's good. All right, so there's, a, there's a usually five minutes or so. Now, the reason I ask is because um, there's a lady called Professor Gloria Mark. She's a professor of in informatics in, in Berkeley University, and she talks about um, this habit of distraction. And so what tends to happen is, I'm sure for, for all of us, we look at these devices and um, we start seeing little red numbers next to icons, and we get drawn into that world with WhatsApp, Slack, um, messages, emails, and so on. And um, what we now start to understand is that um, it uh, drags the brain into distraction. And what Gloria has managed to do by tracking people's PCs is um, in, a, in an office environment anyway, every three minutes, the people get distracted and it takes over 20 minutes to get back to the job at hand. Now, the problem is that when people get distracted, and then go back to the task at hand, they unconsciously speed up and they start producing stress chemicals. Um, and cortisol, which is one of the chemicals that's produced when we're a bit stressed, inhibits oxytocin, which has a negative impact on our ability to um, you know, collaborate and work well with other people. Now, here's the thing. With virtual workers, what I tend to, to find is that they have their connected technology on all of the time. So they'll have Slack running pretty much constantly. Um, whatever other um, instant messaging platform that you're using in-house, we have Favro. We have a number of tools um, just in our, our organization that ping you messages regularly. And so the problem is that with that is that people are in this constant state of distraction and uh, it unconsciously increases their stress level. So that neg negatively impacts things like well-being, uh, productivity, the quality of productivity, uh, collaboration, and engagement. So this is why I wanted to focus on engagement, uh, particularly today. So I wanted to share with you a really um, fascinating kind of story um, from uh, the Navy SEALs, it's Jamie Wheel, who did the original uh, story. So the, the SEALs in America had a bit of a problem. Every time they went up, up, uh, overseas, they were determined to speak the local language. It's part of their value system. Uh, it helps them build rapport with the locals and, um, you know, and, and create, you know, gather intelligence and so on and so forth. When they went to Afghanistan, they, they found that it took them up to six months to learn the language. And the American military, as you can imagine, weren't happy that these very expensive um, assets were sitting in a, basically in a school. So what they did is they put, uh, these guys into sensory deprivation chambers, which are basically like big giant plastic eggs full with uh, saline water. So your body just floats naturally. The water is exactly at body temperature, so you lose all physical sensation. When you close them, they're pitch black um, and dark and totally quiet. And they put the individuals into a deep meditative state. What then occurred is um, they started teaching them the local language. I think it's Pashtun. And what happened was instead of taking six months to learn a language, it only took six weeks. So this is really, really important. And um, this problem of distraction and lack of engagement is answered by this experiment that was done. And um, okay, Abby, we'll see you soon, all right? Um, and the truth of the matter is, is our hunter-gatherer brain was never designed for um, this kind of multitasking world that we're in. 
our brain is at its best when it's focused on a singular task. It's a really, really important message for you and your teams. Um, and this really proves that, that as soon as the brain is focused, it can do extraordinary things like learn a language in six weeks rather than six months. So um, I highly recommend the, the, uh, the book Deep Work. So flow and deep work and deliberate practice, which are three slightly different variations um, of something that's very similar, which is this, this sense of being immersed in a singular activity um, is profoundly important. Now, what do I mean by deep work? Um, basically, it is focused for between 40 minutes to 60 minutes without any distraction whatsoever. No phone in a room, no connected technology switched on at all. You're just focused on a task at hand. And if a lot of your team are you know, engineers and coding and stuff like that, then they've already got a high cognitive load. And it's really important that they understand that um, these, these tools, which are brilliant, um, also have a downside. So 40 minutes, zero distraction, high intensity work. And what that does is it improves productivity. It improves a personal sense of achievement. All of us get to the end of the day and think, blame me, I've not achieved anything. It improves um, our, our kind of uh, stress resilience and reduces stress and anxiety. Um, it improves morale, uh, improves well-being. And as I said earlier, our brain was not designed for 21st century work. Now, we'll stop there um, and just ask uh, everyone, does anyone practice deep work right now? Does anyone practice in deep work right now? Okay. <laughs> okay. So lots of no's. Great. Okay. Good to see. So thanks again for, for your honesty. Um, and it's okay if you're a little bit shy and don't want to sort of put answers in the box. That's, that's totally fine. Um, so the, the truth of the matter is, is that um, I didn't know anything about this either. And um, the, the guys in, in RATAC will tell you I've got this um, a tremendous ability to get stuff done, big chunks of work, and it's down to this predominantly. Um, you know, so in, and it will massively reduce your levels of stress. So um, particularly with, as I said, people working remotely, there's so many distractions, particularly I've got two, two young children, that there are a lot of distractions. So anything you can do to cut that down uh, will massively reduce your stress. Now, I wanted to share this with you. This is from uh, a book called Powerful Engagement by Jim Law and Tony Schwartz. Um, I will put some kind of reading list together as well, by the way. Um, Everything in moderation, okay? So uh, this deep work time, I had a conversation with um, Hilary Scarlett, who's a neuroscientist. And I said, look, Cal Newport in his book, Deep Work, says we've got about four hours a day of this sort of high intensity, high focus work. And she said, well, I'm not sure I agree. I think it's about an hour and a half. And so I'm gonna split the dif difference and say we've got probably about three hours of this um, deep work kind of capacity in our brains. And then for the rest of the day, you do slightly lighter activities, meetings, you know, phone conversations, emailing, and that kind of stuff. So what tends to happen is most of us get into work and um, we sit down in our home office at the minute when, and we see our inbox and immediately our stress levels start to rise as the day goes, as the volume of stuff we deal with. And now because we're remote, we're having literally back to back, back to back, back to back meetings, and we can see the stuff we're not doing, and so unconsciously our stress levels are rising. And at the end of the day, we drink a bottle of wine and then we organize. Um, now that's a it's a huge kind of um, exaggeration, but in many respects, that's what we tend to do. The problem with that is over time, it's toxic. Our brain, like the rest of our body was not designed to do a 12 hour a day workout. We wouldn't go to the gym for 12 hours and yet that's what we tend to do with our brains. So the key with this deep work thing to get it right is to make sure that after you've tried your first 40 to, to sort of 60 minute deep work session, you have a bit of recovery time. Um, 15 to 20 minute break with, a, with water and a healthy snack. 
Okay, so that's just trying to balance this because what people then try to do is you try and do deep work one after the other after the other, and in, that's classic uh, kind of burnout behavior. We are much more um, uh, able to, to deal with that intense work we have recovery. So from David, good question, how does exercise influence deep work? Um, well, it, it exercise is about, uh, for me, it's a way of switching the brain off. Um, so I think the, the best way to answer this is to say, as a recovery mechanism from intensity, I think it's a brilliant tool. So what I'll do after this, because I'm fully focused on this, is I'll get on my uh, road bike and I'll just do a quick half hour ride and that totally refreshes me. Another thing you can do, believe it or not, is juggle. Now, why am I saying that? What it does is it activates a different part of your brain and it relaxes the sort of part of the prefrontal cortex that has been um, uh, working out too. So, right, great. So that, this is what David does as well. Exercise, um, there are, I could talk about exercise as a separate topic for a day. But one thing I'd strongly suggest everyone does is get any form of exercise you can because it is about brain health. So in studies on depression with um, people taking medication versus people taking exercise, exercise wins every time, every single time. It is like exercise because we were hunter-gatherers running around, you know, um, it, it's our, our sort of bio-neurology is designed to work with this kind of bioengineering of the body. So it's a great question, man. Thanks so much for answering it. So, um, so that's the first thing I wanted to talk about engagement. So deep work and you know uh, recovery time, strategic recovery time, burnout. Um, it, stress isn't really the issue per se. It's lack of adequate recovery. Um, so that's the first thing. Now the second thing from the empowers model that I wanted to talk about is positive emotion. So a lot of people think, well, that sounds a little ephemeral. Why, why are we talking about positive emotion? So what I'd like you to do um, is think about a situation that worries you right now. Just think about that situation that worries you right now. It could be something at work, uh, my nine-year-old daughter has not been well. She unfortunately we've had the virus here in our home. Um, so she's been coughing like a coal miner for two weeks. And we've had a couple of nights where she's been up coughing and coughing and coughing. Um, so there are all these situations that really worry us. Now, next, I want you to think about putting a positive spin on the, that thing you are thinking about thinking of ways you can handle that situation or overcome those, those possible obstacles that are in your way. This is purely a private exercise. I'm not going to ask people to put stuff up uh, in the chat box because this is very much uh, a private exercise. And we talked earlier about the fact that it's easy to get stressed working virtually because we've got this um, you know, constant distraction, but it's also lonely. All right, it's really important for, for those leading. It's also lonely. I've done it for years, for 12, nearly 15 years now. Uh, and you lack that daily interaction. And that's certainly the case at the minute, which is why you see a lot of people just randomly working from cafes, just to be around the buzz of other people. Uh, and we do know loneliness is, is linked to depression. So why is positive emotion so important then, particularly in this uh, instance? Why is it so important for you as a leader of people um, to take this um, seriously from this big, long model, empowers model over everything else? Um, and the answer is to do with what positive emotion does. So when I ask you to think about a situation that really worries you, what, what happens is your mind um, starts to narrow its focus, that you can see the problem, usually in all its glory. And it's a bit like the equivalent of a saber-toothed tiger jumping out in front of you. And not only do you see the saber-toothed tiger, you make that saber-toothed tiger bigger and more frightening than it actually is. Not that I've ever met one, uh, but I'm sure. Um, and, and so that's a natural instinct of a mind sort of narrows. And when I asked you to think about putting a positive spin on it, how could you get yourself out of that, overcome the obstacles? What I'm asking you to do is what is known as broaden and build. And that's from Barbara Fredrickson's book, Positivity. 
Barbara was the first one to look at uh, why we have positive emotions. Simple question, why do we have positive emotions? And what she's found through her research, um, so this is Barbara's work, is that firstly, it helps us to broaden our perspective. And positive emotions were critical to cooperation and collaboration and build from independent bands of hunter-gatherers to cohesive little towns and hamlets to cities and so on. Okay, so that's the first thing. Second is we see more opportunities. Now I work with our CEO Gus quite a bit and we do this stuff all of the time. When the brown stuff hits the fan, rather than getting stuck in the problem, we stand back and try and say, where's the opportunity here? There is always, always an opportunity. And so if you maintain a positive stance, it's really important. Now your teams may be struggling with particular issues and particular challenges, raising the emotional state of your team changes their ability to solve problems. It increases your resilience. Now, I think most people are getting past this um, hedonic adaption point. We're getting to a point where we're getting used to this being the new normal. And so right now, we want to use positive emotion to help them uh, increase their resilience because there's going to be more challenges for sure. All right. Now, uh, lastly, from from um, Barbara's work, it's key to individual thriving. So every single person, when I said, you know, imagine you're 109 yourself, talk about happiness, being at peace, being on holiday, and often we're on holiday because we uh, envision this sort of, you know, for me, uh, somewhere like Bali, palm trees, warm breeze through the trees, sit in tranquility, blah, blah, blah. It, it's, it's incredibly important to our well-being, our physical, emotional well-being. Now, Paul Zak, which is the other book you can see there, he's researched oxytocin for 28 years. Oxytocin is produced by positive emotions. Now, Barbara Fredrickson is not a neuroscientist at all. She's a psychologist. So she doesn't even touch this. And so this is more about Paul's work. Oxytocin, as I said earlier, is critical to high-performing teams. Um, and, and, and that's um, something that people haven't quite cottoned on to. If you want a really good high-performing team, high levels of trust, high levels of positive emotion, high levels of purpose. And this positive emotion, this chat that you see often with teams, this joking that happens with high-performing teams, uh, people underestimate how important it is uh, to performance. It's critical to trust building. A lot of the banter that you see between teams um, is actually reinforcing social bonds. Yes, you're one of us. Yes, you belong. Yes, your status is secure. And that's um, David Rock's scarf model uh, that I've just mentioned there. And finally, it's cr critical to maintaining morale in tough times. Um, so I said that I wouldn't spend an hour going through lots and lots of stuff and spend about 40 minutes happy to open to a conversation after this. But um, I wanted to, sh to share a couple of interventions for virtual team thriving. Now, I said I would do three every week, and I've told a fib, I'm giving you a bonus one for. Um, the first one is I would encourage you to get your teams to do 40 minutes to one hour of deep work time every day. How you orchestrate, orchestrate that would be up to you. I'm, I'm very aware that there's different time zones. So the team members would need to know when team members are sort of totally focused and not returning their emails and, and Slack messages, I get that. But I can't tell you how much difference it has made to my life. One simple hack like that. Uh, the second one um, uh, is a virtual coffee. I do this with my guys 10 o'clock every morning. So you know, in the mornings we've got time to just get some focus stuff done. And at 10 o'clock we have a virtual coffee. Um, and that's about creating positive emotion predominantly. Yes, we'll talk a little bit about business, but, but often we, we're just kicking stuff around, um, taking the mickey a little bit out of each other, um, and building the emotional kind of um, state of the team. Uh, it's a really simple thing to do, uh, but it's effective. Right, connected technology sprints. This is the other thing that I do. So um, I will not answer emails in the morning period. Um, rarely will I answer Slack messages unless it's to, you know, one or two of the directors and, and, and Gus, our CEO. Um, because 
I'm aware that if I get into that habit of distraction, I find it very difficult to focus when I'm doing my sort of one thing I need to get done that day. So I tend to do it in sprints. So at lunchtime, I'll look at my emails. Today, I probably won't look at them until after three o'clock this afternoon. Now, I know you've got different pressures on you, but um, I'd highly recommend 30-minute sprint of email and Slack. Just 30 minutes and then get back to something that's important. Uh, and then the final one is physically move. Um, Dave said it earlier, couldn't agree more. Exercise, profoundly important to recovery time. It's a way of removing yourself from this world of business and busyness to you know, a, a state where you just zone out. And a lot of um, athletes will talk about their flow experiences, like runners, I was just in the flow. Just totally in a moment, wasn't thinking about anything. Um, you know, so you're trying to get to, to that point. Now, they're the four interventions for this week. Please just choose one. Um, we know from um, habit science that if you try and uh, create two or more new habits, uh, you're destined to fail. So I'd strongly recommend you just do one. All right, so that's us. That's the Empowers model. Um, and that is just two elements that I think are really, really important um, for your team. So I'm going to come out of um, this sharing mode. I'm just going to stop sharing so I can go back to full screen. Thanks, everyone, for hanging in. Um, does, does anyone have uh, any questions? I'm just going to... Anything you want to stick in a chat box? Um, I'm just going to scroll down. Does gender come into play in any of this? Can you, can you be a bit more specific, David? Uh, if you're okay to talk, by the way, I'll, I'm happy to unmute you. So if you say yes, I'll, I'll unmute you because I'm... Are women better at multitasking? <laughs> Are you okay to be unmuted? There's about a 10 second delay between me asking, I've realized. And um, uh, so the answer is that nobody multitasks. That's the honest answer. Um, we task switch. And um, we've, we've looked at people's brains in real time. And what we're doing, what some people are able to do is switch between tasks quickly. The problem with that is, is it stresses the brain. So multitasking is a fallacy um, and it's actually not how our brain was designed. So um, no, there isn't any difference and no, nobody's really a multitasker. We, ta we task switch um, and it's, it's not a healthy thing to do. Um, so thanks very much for answering that question. So um, I had a couple of questions from me just to sort of, um, you know, keep, keep the wheels turning a little bit. Um, are there any specific challenges that you're facing at the minute, uh, particularly with, with having a team that's now virtual? But again, like I said, I'm, I'm happy to unmute. I'm conscious some people may be um, in an environment where they can't be unmuted, but um, I'll be interested in no. that. I'll give you a couple of seconds. And while you're kind of thinking and letting the, the gray matter sort of turn, uh, it does look like I lost a bunch of people, which is, um, which is a pain in the bum. Um, what I would say is that next week, we are gonna go into more about the neuroscience of, of high-performing teams. And um, again, some practical uh, tips that you can use to get uh, your teams working well, particularly when they're uh, remotely uh, based. Other question I had was, has anyone had any aha uh, moments um, or confirmation of something you already knew deep down in your heart and now you're starting to see the signs uh, to the support that? What if your team members are misusing working from home? Blimey, me, that's a bloody good question. I am a great believer in um, being completely transparent with people. Uh, I, don't, um, I don't hide away from having it, uh, the challenging conversations. Um, I think people, some people struggle to adapt to working from home because it takes a certain sense of self-discipline. When you're in an office environment, 
you're surrounded by people who are cracking on and doing work. But in a home environment, you don't have that level of self-discipline. So this is really a brilliant question. Personally, I would just have the honest conversation. And my conversation would be something like, look, I'm making these observations. Um, you know, uh, don't seem to see you online very often. And, or you're showing up for meetings late. Um, or whatever the situation is, I've made these observations. Now that's that's non-emotional; they're just observations. Can you tell me what's going on? And that's how I would start that conversation. In my experience, ninety-five percent of people come to work to do a good job. I'm not discounting there is a five percent, and um, so I would certainly approach it as a series of observations you made, which are just factual, and then take it from there. Um, so Phil's asked, what effect do you think the virtual world has on effective collaboration? Um, I think that's a, a really wise question, actually. I've run virtual teams nearly all of my life over the last 15 years. And I think that um, virtual work has a small negative impact on collaboration. Um, but by and large, I've been able to sustain and maintain a highly collaborative, highly engaged team in much the same way I would if I was face to face. I would say it's about 95% of being face to face. And the way I've done that is I've increased the cadence of when we catch up um, and I've deliberately engineered social connection into when we catch up. And I think Ryan and uh, Rod to, to my team um, would support that. Um, that's really important. And I tend to find, because I've been in the world of Agile, uh, Agile has a series of ceremonies if people aren't aware of, of Agile, and which is about really um, being innovative, collaborative, uh, cross-functional teams, getting stuff done quickly, close to the customer, um, building stuff that really matters. And um, the, the reality is in that kind of environment, you know, collaboration is profoundly important but we tend to focus on outcomes all the time. So I, I see stand-ups, these, these uh, you know, daily stand-ups, retrospectives, talking about hard outcomes. Where are we with this? And use a story that, and are we here? And, and what we forget is the social glue, that when you've got a strong social glue, all of those hard outcomes improve. So I think it's a brilliant question. Um, I think you just have to work harder on the social glue piece, whilst constantly maintaining a focus on the outcomes piece as well. So um, can we have a list of books? Uh, the answer is absolutely. I'll put together a reading list. Um, so um, let me see. So this, uh, as you can see, all of the books behind me are, are, are also books I would recommend in a heartbeat. So what I'll try and do is put myself in the shoes of, if I'd never knew this science before, where would I start? I would probably start with Flourish from Marty Seligman, uh, Deep Work, which is very practical from Cal Newport, uh, Spark, for those of you who know you need to do a bit of exercise, because when you read that, trust me, there is no, you just go blinking, Nora, I better get onto this. Um, it's a brilliant, brilliant book. Okay, with the current team, uh, I'm supporting in transition to Scrum. Uh, since the furlough, I'm seeing less interaction and collaboration, brilliant, uh, between team members and more reverting back to individuals receiving instructions uh, and going back to their comfort zone instead of collaborating together. Right. So what I would suggest, um, so give this a try, Phil, is um, get them all together on a Zoom like this and say, right, um, we're in this new world. How about let's be creative. Let's have some fun. Um, Let's kick around some, what are 10 crazy, crazy ass ideas to help us maintain a level of social connection and maintain our level of collaboration. Because when we're together, it's been fun, it's been awesome. Um, what can we do? Then you shut your mouth and allow them to start. Now, just that process of cool collaboration um, will help start building, um, you know, more social glow. I think it's really important that um, we give people the opportunity to be creative, right? And then allocate responsibility, mate. So what I'd say is, right, Mary, brilliant idea. Can you run with that? When can you get something, 
you know, rolled out. By Tuesday, perfect, right. Mary's gone around with that. John, what do you, you said so and so earlier, we all thought was awesome. How could you roll that out? Can you take ownership of that? And then what you'll end up with is a whole bunch of people starting to take ownership so it doesn't fall back to you. You know, it can't be all about Phil, you know, carrying the weight. That's that's um that's bloody hard work at the best of times, you know. So um so yeah, and, and they will run with it. I mean, I, you know, I I am I've got a great team. I've got people that I, I care about deeply. They they passionate and awesome human beings, but we're all fallible. We all have bad days. Um, and to a degree, Phil, you know, if you're not used to, if you transition into Scrum, they've been used to a more traditional environment where they get told, can you do this and can you do that? And now you've got this great opportunity to say, look, it's all new to all of us. What should we do? What can we test? What can we experiment with in an agile kind of way? What can we have fun with? And if it doesn't work, who cares? We learned something. What could we do different? What should we try now? What will we do differently again? So, um, so there you go. Any more questions? Is everybody good? Is everybody good? So I said at the start of this, um, you cannot understand what creates a great team in, in even in a virtual or non-virtual world if you don't understand what makes people thrive because then you've only got a toolkit for a team so there is a whole neuroscience of teams that's an important toolkit but then there are other individual components that without the individual component you're missing this link so next week will be a big week to be the neuroscience of teams and i'm going to focus on simple interventions to improve any team um, stuff that i've used in the past um, stuff that i've only learned in the last year or two and um, I'd encourage you to just try one of those interventions. So I'll just go through them quickly again so that we don't forget. Um, so the first one is deep work, 40 minutes to an hour. Most people, in my experience, could only manage 40 minutes first time round. And you'll find that you'll start getting a little distracted. And that's normal because our brains are so used to distraction, even focusing for 30 to 40 minutes is a challenge. So that's the first intervention. Um, if you wish, and, and try with your team. Second one, virtual coffee. Get the oxytocin levels up, or as Phil's gonna do, you know, get the team talking about things they can do to have fun and increase engagement and all of that kind of good stuff. And what you're doing is you're actually re releasing more oxytocin, and you're improving the sort of flow of positive emotion, and um, that creates what Barbara Frederick Fredrickson calls an upward spiral of positivity. Um, and nearly every high performing team has this sort of sense of, um, of humor and fun and, and also a clear focus on, you know, the hard stuff, the outcomes as well. Um, connected technology, sprints, 30 minute sprints of email or Slack or checking your Favreau boards or whatever it happens to be. Um, and finally, uh, physically move. Um, now that might be just for you personally, that's fine. Um, but I would encourage um, anyone to, to, to get some form of exercise, which I'll be doing in about 10 minutes. Um, John Rakey's book literally changed my life. I realized, um, so my wife who had postnatal depression, um, there were two things that she did that got her out of that. Exercise and a gratitude practice. Gratitude um, starts teaching your brain how to look for the positives in things even when times are tough so um so positive emotion works gratitude is a mechanism by which you you start to open your mind broaden and build positive state and blah 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 so there you go i've just focused on two elements of the empowers model today but i thought both of them were simple um but practical and will actually make a big big difference next week neuroscience of teams um, we'll have more people on that uh, workshop, I'm sure, because I won't screw up the, uh, the invite process. Um, and if you have any questions in between times, let me know, uh, or Ryan or Rod, I think you're receiving emails from those guys. Um, so it's alan.furlong at radtech.com. Um, I will get this recording put together and send out to all of you here and everybody on the original list from last week. 
And by all means, share with your teams, uh, share with colleagues, and um, you know, spread the joy. This is this is about just putting good stuff out into the world to help us all. Um, I, I often in these exchanges, I pick up things uh, from you that I've worked, which are which are gold. So that's brilliant. Um, okay, so be awesome. Please look after yourself. Please stay safe and well. And I will see you all next Thursday at 12.30 uh, for the uh, neuroscience of teams. Okay. See you all. Take care. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. To, yeah. That's, that's kind of you, David. I'm sure she'll be fine. She's, she was running around today, which is the first time I've seen her run around. Um, and no problem, Andrew. I'm glad you're here. I'll, I'll get the full video to you. Uh, so God bless you all. All right. Take care and uh, see you next week. All the best.